one I can half show you in a minute as well. So I was thinking about um, building one of the critter robots that I talked about in a previous video and I was looking at, um, you know, I think it's about $15 to buy, which isn't too bad um, for the 3D printed files. And I thought, oh, my, I could probably design one of them myself in Fusion 360. And I also thought rather than just using their proprietary board, I could use a Pico because I've few of them spare on my desk there and I thought why not give that a go and I thought one of the weird things about this robot is it has just two legs and it looks rather like um, the critter looks rather like half a quad robot so I've got a quad robot just here um, smiles quad robot and it kind of looks like half of one of them if we just chopped off the bottom half of it there that's what we'd actually end up with so I thought this is a, an interesting sort of challenge. Let's see what we can do with this. So Pico Crab was sort of born. So so in this session, we're going to talk about what is Pico Crab, why, what are the design goals for it, why does it have only two legs, um, and we'll go through some of the design as well. And this is a work in progress. This isn't something I've finished that I can say, did -da, here it is. And I thought it was quite an interesting thing to show you, um, something that I'm working on. So what is Pico Crab? So as I've said, it's a Pico powered crab robot. Um, I've had this in my mind's eye for quite some time now as a crab. I just thought it'd be a quite a cute design. Um, so it has a Raspberry Pi Pico inside. It has the range finder at the front for the eyes. Uh, it's got two legs, um, which is essentially just four servos, SG90 servos, and it's going to be running the MicroPython code. It's actually going to be running a lot of the code that we've already written over the past couple of weeks. So the rangefinder code, uh, the servo easing to make the legs more natural movement, um, as well as um, just some of that, some of that classes that we've already written there for the servos. So the design goals for me for this particular one was I wanted to design a small robot. I love that, that sort of size of robot, the sort of SMARS size, the uh, auto DIY, that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, what can I bring to this uh, party uh, without, you know, stealing too heavily from the critter design? Um, so I wanted to design a small robot. I wanted to create a robot that was designed specifically for the Raspberry Pi Pico. So um, one of the things that this has is at the very back, there's a Raspberry Pi Pico port. If we sort of open up inside there, we can see that the uh, the Pico, at the moment it's just sort of floating around. I've not designed the little interior uh, area that, 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 that it will sit inside because uh, I wasn't sure whether I should put the batteries underneath or on top. Um, however, you can probably just see there that that fits in nicely and we've got the port at the back there too. So it's designed for the Raspberry Pi Pico. I'll just drop the range finder on the floor there. There we go. And um, I wanted to improve my Fusion 360 skills. So I was running the hobby version of Fusion 360 and they've introduced a few changes to that recently where you can only have like 10 documents open at a time. You couldn't do any cloud based rendering, that kind of thing. So I thought, you know, is it time to sort of splash out and buy the full license of Fusion 360? So I shelled out and bought the full version of Fusion 360. So that means I can, you know, use all the functionality of that now. I could do more than one sheet when I'm designing the uh, the sort of CAD view of it. Um, and I thought, you know, it'd be a good opportunity to improve my design skills. So I've got sort of beginner to intermediate skills, I would say on Fusion 360. And I thought it's time to sort of really solidify some of those skills. And I wanted to have some fun as well, some, create something that was uh, just a bit of fun. So why only two legs? It's really weird, isn't it, as, as a design? Because it means essentially it's going to be dragging its butt along the floor as it walks. It sort of creeps and crawls. Um, if you if you look at the video of the critter, how that moves around, it is quite funny. Uh, and I thought, I, I want to do that. I want, it's unusual. I want to try that out. So um, it's a novel way of moving about. Um, it's simple uh, to design and create. Um, it is a bit of a challenge because I've not designed a robot from scratch before. Uh, and I thought I could reuse a lot of the SMARS things because I've done all the Fusion 360 videos previously, quite a few months ago now, uh, on the original quad robot, designing each part from scratch in Fusion. Uh, I kind of know all the measurements for that. I've got them all written down in my book and I can just quickly pull them up and uh, recreate them. Uh, I thought it'd be you know, a bit of a challenge to do that. It's cute and it's fun. And, and essentially I, I wanted to do it. So, you know, that's as good as reading as any really, isn't it? So, you know, what is the insight into why I've designed this? Like I said, it's loosely based on this uh, critter, uh, two-legged robot. Um, it was quite quick to design, actually, because what I did, and I'll show you in Fusion 360 in a minute, I actually started with the um, Smiles um, 
chassis, uh, not the quad, but just the, the, sh the smart chassis. Uh, I, I reuse things like the frame that the, um, which if you've ever printed out a Smiles uh, quad robot. So the, the chassis is the same for pretty much, I've got one here, for pretty much all the uh, Smiles robots, apart from it doesn't have these, these lugs on it. Um, so that sort of bottom piece is exactly the same for them. And then there's a, there's a frame that sort of slots over the top of that, that these um, servo holders attach to. So I thought I'll start there. Again, it's quite simple to, to model up the Smiles robot. It's essentially just a, a rectangle that's uh, yeah, is it 70 uh, millimeters by 58 millimeters and then about 32 millimeters high and then you just round off the the corners and the bottom by four millimeters and if you shell that out um, inside give it like a two or three millimeter shell that's pretty much a smiles chassis so that's what i did to start off with with this created the frame around it attached to servo holders that i quickly mocked up on there and uh, kind of went from there really so I, I didn't actually import into the design any of these parts. I did create them all from scratch with Infusion. The only one that I didn't design was the uh, the rangefinder because that's quite a complicated piece. But I just wanted to get the uh, the sort of measurements right for that. So like I said, but the, by reusing in my mind's eye then pieces from the Smiles Quad Robot, mainly these these legs and the servo holders and the arms, um, I kind of knew how this would work. Uh, and like I said, yeah, the Smiles chassis um, started from there, modified from there. So you can see on this particular screenshot that I took from Fusion, that's how I started the design. But the design that I've ended up with doesn't have that sort of square chassis. Um, I'll show you how we morphed into that. So if I hold up this half of the uh, the robot here, you can see that it's got these, um, um, like the frames kind of built into this all in one. And it's got the uh, the front there. So if I put his rangefinder face back in, you can kind of see how this fits together. And then there's a a top that fits on there as well. So it's not quite it's not quite there yet, and we'll get to that in a minute. This is literally iteration one of the design. Uh, these things usually go through a few iterations just so you can tweak all the different measurements and things. So I'll talk about that in a minute. We can see there the rangefinder, you know, we've used that on all the Smiles robots and Otto DIY uses the same one. I quite like them. They look quite cute as a, as a face. Uh, and I, as I've said a few times already, we started with the Smiles uh, chassis and the Smiles servo holders. Um, so it's Pico powered, um, which means we can run MicroPython on it. That's definitely my language of choice. I've been looking at MicroPython before the Pico came out. Uh, I've had that running on some ESP32s, uh, ESP82688s, and also the, um, the Microbit. And I wanted to have a play around with, um, you know, installing MicroPython and what the limitations, what can you do with it, what you can't do with it. Um, and it's a bit fiddly to get it installed on, on the other devices. Um, particularly if they don't have that, uh, is it called SAMD, where you can plug in a USB thing and it appears as a drive. Um, if if it hasn't got that, then it's quite tri tr quite tricky to actually flash the uh, the firmware image onto it. So I did that with a few of them. Quite happy, you know, that, that I got that to work. Uh, but I kind of left it at that. So now that the Raspberry Pi Pico's come along, um, it's got the whole ecosystem around that, and we can use VS Code. That makes things up very different. So. Yeah, quite pleased with that. And we're definitely going to be using the MicroPython classes that we've already created for the, um, uh, I think I've typed that wrong there. Reuse code from our PicoCat, Pico Cat. Um, server easing code. So we did a, a session on server easing, servo easing, where instead of the servo just going to the angle, it can sort of ramp up and slow down. And it makes it much more natural kind of fluid movement. And the rangefinder code we designed that last week as well, so um, we can put that into um, into our crab. So if you like these videos, um, please make sure you subscribe, like the channel, uh, leave me a comment, tick the little bell, all that kind of usual YouTubey stuff that people always tell you to uh, to do, uh, and that helps just uh, spread the news. And, you know, people get to find my channel, and uh, you know we all get better robots because we all get together. One of the things I started a couple of uh, weeks ago now was the Small Robots Group on Facebook. So if you head over to um, facebook.com slash group slash small robots, you'll find the group that I've created there. I think we've got over 670 odd um, people who've joined that now, and it's it's quite a vibrant little community there. So come over to that if you've not already. Um, and also head over to the Smiles uh, community as well. That's quite a, a nice group. That's where all my passion for these small robots started. So. 
we'll jump into the um just jump over to that. So we'll, we'll jump over to the um fusion 360 in a second i uh, just wanted to show you a few things as it stands today so and, and the, the similarities and differences between this and the quad so you can see that it's quite delicately put together there i've not quite got the uh, um the top of the case quite right um so what i haven't done is properly um, slice this together with the servo holder. I haven't got the face piece. There's like a black piece that fits over there. And there's these weird sort of wing things that are sticking out there. So on the, the iteration that I'm going to show you in a minute, they, they've disappeared. And the other thing, I don't know if you can see this on here, but there's quite a bit of strain on that on that uh, piece there. So that isn't that that servo there is, is literally getting squished. It's not quite sat in there properly. So if I show you, this is one of the pieces that hasn't actually got a servo in it at the moment. It's just the, the arm piece and the uh, servo holder piece. That's where the servo goes in. If I put it that way around, the servo will, will fit into there. Let's see if I have a servo handy to, to do that with. Of course I've not. Let's just grab one out of here and we can uh, put a servo in it. Like I said, I just modeled these up from um, Sort of muscle memory of what these things are like. So if I put this, so this this particular one hasn't been um, cleaned up in any way. This has literally come off my 3D printer. I'll show you there, there's actually a piece of um, support material still in there, but for this particular use, that's fine. So if I get this servo and I just put that into place there, you can kind of see one of the first challenges we've got is that doesn't quite fit in, it's really tight. So that bottom piece there that this sort of piece here on the, the iteration that I've just done of this now it doesn't have that bottom piece so these servos really just attached by by these arm pieces in there and depending which servo you buy sometimes the wire comes out the side it comes out a bit higher up on the side sometimes it comes out on the bottom and again because we don't know where them are uh, it makes sense not to have this piece in there so I've, I've actually redesigned these pieces since then but anyway if I actually show you this this servo holder and this is the arm and the way that these connect together is there's these little diamond holes and on the side of that there's the the diamond shape and the tolerance on that is zero at the moment so that slots on there and it's kind of a friction piece that's not actually going to fall out that's how how well fitting together they are but because there's no tolerance um, if you try pushing these pieces together so that they fit into place the, the diamond shapes don't have any tolerances either if I show you that there you can see it's sort of bending a little bit so I need to rework that and I think it's actually the diamond pieces that need to have slightly smaller we don't want it too small and this is where it might take a few iterations of that because it will rattle if it's too too small so there and the other thing I did as well is I printed out four pieces that were all the same so these these servo holders actually get mirrored on the other side of the design and I printed out four of all the same type, so that's why I've only got half of my robot at the moment. So you can see that, but I mean, they are attaching on quite nicely. I've got the feet pieces. So the feet are modeled to be similar to the Smiles Quad. If I show you that side by side though, you can see this, this one has got a much wider foot. Um, but in every other dimension, I think they're pretty identical. It's just quite a bit sort of, uh, wider you can see there they're very similar in, in how they are i've actually got this one the correct way around and on this quad robot i actually put these pieces on upside down so the the pivot point is too high up that pivot point should be down there that was a mistake made this was the very first quad robot i built um you can see there there's the sort of holes as well for the um for the servo horns little white pieces that are in there so i've modeled them in as well and if i hold up a regular chassis next to this you can see the kind of you know they're almost identical in size wise to that apart from this one tapers off at the end because we want it to have that sort of crab look it's kind of like a heart shape the the crab so that's what we want it to uh, to look like and that's the sort of front of it there as well some other weird things when i was modeling this um i i modeled like a round that front section there is what i modeled first as an oval and if I put this on top here, and I'll just push that into place. And I've not cleaned this up very well. There we go. Um, 
this oval here, I basically just extruded this back and cut that into the design. And what that essentially did is it cut out this piece here. And then when I lifted that up as a, as a split piece of um, surface split, it's kind of made these pieces a weird kind of taper. You compare that to how that looks on, on this, on the quad robot, if I just push that there, they are, let's see if I can get that in shot. Um, so we're looking at, looking at these pieces just here, they, they kind of have a roundness to them. And on this one, it did have that, but then it sliced off because of the way that I model it. So I've actually gone in and repaired that and uh, made it so it doesn't look quite sliced off. I also printed this on a um, standard rather than the super high quality. So there is a bit of a roughness to the surface on the top. It's not too bad actually, it does kind of hold its shape well. And um, I created like a little lug on that side there that, that slots into this piece here, but I didn't actually mirror that across there. So this, this other end here is kind of quite loose. Whereas on this side, that lug that's just in there um, slots into place. So yeah, this is coming along. There's quite a few things I want to go back in and fix. Again, the, the tolerance on that, it's too tight. So I need to just add a little bit um, on this arm to make it a tiny fraction taller. And also that will get rid of that bending effect that's that's occurring on there uh, um, on there as well. You can see just, just there where it's sort of bending through. But it's coming together. I'm quite pleased with that. So let's head over to uh, Fusion 360 and I can show you um, what it looks like in there. So let me just head over to there. So here we go. This is the Fusion 360 file that I've been working on. You can see there version 34. That's how many saves and iterations I've done with this. And what I'll do is I'll just reverse the timeline so that we can see literally how this thing starts off. I'm not going to build it for you. I'm just going to sort of talk you through the different steps that we went through to design this. So let me move it right to the very beginning you can see there's an awful lot of things that have happened on there i'm just going to rewind that all the way back it's kind of undoing everything and let's go all the way back again and i think we're nearly there now to the very beginning so there we go that's the very first sketch so if i just bring this up what i did there 70 by 58 um, and i also modeled in just just because i was trying to place in my mind's eye you know what what, what, what were these um servo holders going to look like. So I didn't model that front piece here first. Uh, it was literally just the, the chassis. Uh, I then extruded up the chassis to uh, to be a rectangle. So let's just bring that in. And I did the usual kind of smiles things where we just sort of round off the corners and the bottom. Uh, I then shelled it out. And I then started to put some other sketches to it as well. So I'm just gonna, you can see there the cutouts that we have on the side of the, the regular smiles. Um, design it's quite of a iconic design that so these nice cutouts I don't know why I did this because I eventually changed it but at this point I didn't know what the robot would look like I was just kind of playing with the design so I did a bit of work on that uh, did the usual kind of cutouts I could have brought in a previous model but um, I thought I'll just do it all in, in this one thing so I brought in the, um, the range finder and I just blocked out what the servo holder would look like on the side there so then i think i just moved that into place i started to create that oval shape that will become the face i knew that that's what i wanted it to look like i think i might even have um my original sketch in one of these books actually i can show you Let's see if I can quickly find that so i hope you can see this let's see if i can get it to uh focus on that very poor picture of a crab. <clears throat> so that's kind of what I was going for in my mind's eye. Uh, and then I sort of refined that a few different times from there. So let's go further. So this is me then working on this, um, um, on the actual servo, on the servo hold. If I turn the servo hold off there, you can see I'm basically just modeling up what a servo looks like. Um, I then just create a couple of extra planes and so on. I start working on the arm piece. I knew that it was going to be red because I've got lots of red filament loaded on my 3D printer. And that was partly what made me think about a crab because um, um, in my mind's eye, you know, is it SpongeBob SquarePants, Mr. Crab, Mr. Crabby, Crabby's party, whatever, he, he, uh, he's bright red, isn't he? 
Um, so I knew the face needed to be a dark colour because you want it to sort of the eye to be, you know, inside the shell, sort of dark and hidden. So I thought a black piece would work well for that. Uh, and then I just started to model out the rest of these other pieces, uh, duplicating the servo. So once I've created a part within there, I would literally just copy it. And that meant if I needed to go back in and just tweak the design, that because it's copied, um, any other object which is a copy of the original one will also get those tweaks. So that was a nice way of uh, just speeding up any things I needed to change there. So then added in the, uh, this is me just modeling out the foot piece. So I'm sort of mirroring these pieces across. There's the, the foot, adding some fillets to that and some cutouts. Can't quite see them on this angle. If I just move that up a little bit, you can just see there the foot and there's the, the little cutouts that give it that nice sort of texture to it. Um, so then I was just doing the cutouts for the uh, servo horn and let's carry on there. Move forward a bit more. I mirrored that across so we've got you design one leg you get the other one for free because you just mirror it across uh, let's just go over to this bit here and this is where I then started to look at right I'm not happy with that chassis it looks too blocky so I just laid down a um, two arcs and just joined them together and I thought that looks kind of what I'm going for I looked at lots of pictures of crabs <laughs> on, the, on, on the internet as well just to see you know what, what do they look like uh, I then started to model out the um, the frame piece, so I can show you that. That's the frame piece. If I just hide um, the chassis for a second, the, the frame is this sort of blocky thing which fits over the top of the quad. Um, and then after a bit, I ditched the, the, the actual frame and then just went with what the frame provides, which is these two supports for the, the servo holder. And um, let me just carry on with that. So started to model out that piece there worked on that then created the the servo horns themselves these little white pieces um, and the actual screw as well there's a little screw that's modeled in there you can see that I start off with a little circle cut out a little crosshair on it and then I just sort of replicate those pieces across there and apply a nice metallic shiny appearance to it um, we then add some extra servo pieces down there you can see the little screw and over there as well there's another screw and then what I then do in a minute, there's a section where I start putting all the joints together. So I might place them just with a capture to begin with. And um, I'll then lock them into place with a, um, a joint. And I've not really worked with joints properly before. And on this version I have, and I can show you what, what the effect of that is. So you can see there is little faces appearing. I then start combining, combining various different pieces together so that they're all just one body piece. Uh, I put the little cut out the back there for the um, for the USB port, so that that's that there. Um, I think I actually did bring in the um, Pico that I designed a couple of weeks ago as well as a as another component. So I didn't I didn't design that one from scratch in this particular model. So this is something that I did, um, and this is where some of the quirks came from. So if I just step back a second, so we've got this piece here, which is the um, it's going to be the top of the case and essentially I just extr uh, extrude that back and you can see there that that's done a weird thing so it's got a thickness to it you get that nice sort of curvature but that's where it's starting to cut this piece here you can see that originally looks nice and round like that but then this piece sort of comes across and cuts it in half or cuts the top of it off and then there's these weird bits at the top here that are sort of sticking through. So the next couple of actions will um, remove those two pieces. As you can see there, you don't delete them, you remove them. <laughs> that was something I learned on Fusion. And then the other thing I did was just extrude this sort of shape up through that, um, that top case. Uh, and you can see it sort of coming together there. There's still some quirky things at that point in the design. So you can see there, there was a, a sort of weird hole that had appeared and there was a the, the the top case has this piece on it like a little wing and it doesn't quite mate properly with that piece there it looks weird so i do some fixing fixing up of that shortly and what else do we do next so applying a few more fillets to the to the design making that top surface nice and rounded 
um, removing some other pieces that we didn't want from there. And then the next thing that I did was ground the case. So this is, when we're using joints, one of the really important things we need to do is we need to decide which piece do all the other pieces connect to because that piece is, needs to be grounded. That's the one that's going to stay rigid and everything else will sort of move around that. So that's what we've done there. And then I start to very slowly, one joint at a time, start joining all these pieces together. So I've joined this case um, to the servo, the servo to the servo holder, the arm to the servo holder, the servo horn to the servo arm, the screw to the servo arm, the servo holder two to the arm, and then the foot to the servo that's in there. And I've used different joints. I've used, if I just go all the way to the end there, you can see now that they're all in place. Now, some of them are rigid joints so that they are, if I just take that piece again, um, where's it gone? There we go. So when I've got this piece, which is the, the servo holder and I've got the servo holder arm and I'm sort of locking them together, I want that joint to be rigid. I don't want that to flex in any way. So I've got rigid joints for them. But then on the other pieces like this, this foot, um, I've made that so that pivots around this piece here. So if I just flip around to the front and sort of get this into a better position. So what I've done there is this whole piece can sort of move around because there's a pivot um, here on that on the axis exactly where the, the servo is. And you can provide um, minimum and maximum joints limits as well. So I can do that and it won't go any further. Without them, it will actually go right through the design. It just sort of clashes with it. Um, and then you can also say what the rest position is. So if I move that and then I let go, um, it snaps back to there. And then if I move that piece there, you can see that's the, the maximum and that's the minimum it can go to. So he can get his feet right underneath him. Um, and it's the same on the other side as well. If I just grab those pieces, they've all got the, the freedom of motion that we want it to have as well. So that's that. Um, that means we can also do like a motion study. So in Fusion 360, there is... Um, um, a thing called a motion study we bring that up and what you essentially do with the motion study you, you click the joint that you want to animate so if I click on this one here and then I just add a position on on the timeline that I want to move this to and I'll give it a angle of 90 degrees like that if I now play that you'll see it'll just do that one movement if I put another point on that timeline and make that um, minus 45 for example and then I play that again, it's gonna, it's gonna keep doing that motion like so. And you can have as many of these joints on there as you want. So you can have the other one. We can add Sorry, a point to I that. Don't know that. <laughs> Need to mute her when I do these streams. Let's do that one to minus 45 as well. And then if I play that, they're, they're all sort of gonna move around. And I can also add um, the foot moving up and down as well on there if I wanted to. You can actually use them as a, an animation and render that out as a full, Sort of walking animated thing as well i'll just uh, hide those joints that are there and if i just uh, move these they'll just snap back to that rest position as well so that was quite a bit of work putting all those joints together but uh, what i've got now is something i can move around and i've never been able to do this before this was sort of something i learned by doing this model so i can actually move all these pieces around um, so what else do we do then um, so this is me then if i just flip excuse me to the back of the case so these, these steps here are me sort of cleaning up some of these issues that we have. So I created a little cut out there that I could then extrude and slice off that weird wing thing that's on this design at the moment. So these, these weird little wings that are on the top of the case that we don't need, I've sliced them off now. <clears throat> um, the other thing then I thought was, if I zoom right in here, I didn't like the way that this was sliced off. I just thought it looked a bit rough. So um, what I then did was let me just move it forward to that sketch. So that sketch there is what it should look like. So I then just extruded that out. So we've now got like the repaired piece. But you can see there the colour shows you that that's actually a different body. So I then had to join that body, combine that to the main, um, the main chassis, the main case. Uh, and that's it um, sort of finished, I think. Yeah. So one of the other things that I've, I've discovered um, I've not played with before in Fusion. So you've got all these different pieces there and you can apply different um, appearances to them to choose what colour they are. So like the, the servos are this transparent blue colour, the face is black and the body is 
blue, uh, red, and we've got these servo horns as um, a nylon white, and then we have a, a metallic colour for the for the screws, and they they look quite reflective there. Uh, and when you put it into the rendering engine, it it will actually render whatever the environmental image is, so it looks really realistic when you do that. But what I didn't realise you could do, if I press uh, Shift and N, I can get it into this sort of component um, colour. So I think it's called, under inspect, component colour cycle toggle. You can see there, so Shift and N, just to enable or disable that. And it, what it means is every component that you have, uh, components are these things with the square block, assemblies are like multiple blocks there. Uh, and the single blocks are uh, components. So each one of these components has a unique colour. And you can also see on the timeline there, the colour responds uh, corresponds to those pieces. So there's a, there's a green piece just at the end there, and that's the, the bottom case, the chassis. So it just makes it very a, a lot easier for you to sort of, you know, understand what your model looks like. It's quite pretty as well there, but... It's like when I was a uh, when I was a kid playing with Lego, and uh, I never used to have enough colours, uh, enough of the same colour. So you know, you build a house, and it was like this ugly multicoloured thing, and I was always dis you know disappointed that they weren't all the same colour. Uh, and this is what this is like actually. <laughs> so if I just do Shift and N again, we can sort of toggle that on or off. Oops, on or off. So I thought that was quite a useful thing to to know about. And what we can also do now, if I just go back to the home position, go to top and zoom in, we can switch off the shell uh, top and we can look inside. And I think I've not got the Raspberry Pi Pico um, switched on there. If I do that, you can see that's the sort of natural colour. And that's the, the Pico that I modelled up um, a couple of shows ago when that first came out. And I can also put the uh, the case lid back on there as well. So the other thing I was going to show you about this, um, what was that to do with it? Was something I was just going to look at then. What was I thinking about then? It was something to do with. Um, it'll come back to me in a minute. something about was it a modeling technique was it one of the functions that's within here so with this full version of fusion 360 you do get this uh, generous design so if you want to um, create a model with the most efficient shape using the least amount of material this generative design will do some really funky things with that um, you end up with these like spider web type structures quite impressive and it uses some um, some AI I believe to, to, to produce that. Uh, we can also do some rendering in there and you can see that I've got some rendered images of the uh, the robot already. Ah, I remembered what it was to do with now is to do with views. I'll show you that now. So we've uh, got a couple of different rendered images there and I can save them out as um, transparent background PNG files or um, as full animations if I want to do a movie like a turntable movie. You do have to pay for the credits for them. You get so many credits, I think, free when you sign up for the license, but then you have to pay for the extra ones beyond that. So, yeah, so I remember the thing I wanted to show you, and it's to do with named views. So, so when you, you're moving this robot around with a little cube here, um, you might think, right, I want, I want to come back to this exact same view. So up here, you've got named views, and you get the, the standard ones kind of for free. You've got, like, top, you've got front, you've got right um, and home and you know these correspond to these names on the the actual cube there but you might want a very specific look for your for your view so you might you might have spent you know a while just sort of angling this right and getting like a really dramatic shot or something that you want to to use so say i want to keep that there i can just go to named views do a new name view and i'll call this one um, i'll call it hero shot two so hero shot is one that i did which is just the angle there um, and then hero shot two if i go back to to that one there we go got that nice dramatic shot so it means we can very quickly move between these different positions and when we go to the render tab we can use those different positions again uh, to get the exact shot that we want so i can go back to there and get my nice shot there and i can click render and then i can either choose um, cloud render and it'll just send off the 
the raw file because all these things are stored already in Fusion 360 online. Um, and you can see though it says it takes it costs two credits. So if I clicked on render on that one, let's see what happens. I can't remember if I actually have any credits or not on this. Um, yeah, and it'll just go in, it'll just render it out. So it usually it takes a lot less than they say. They, they give themselves, oh, it takes 10 minutes, but it just comes back done. You can do local rendering as well. Um, you just get a, a bit of fan noise for a couple of minutes, uh, not even a minute to be honest, about 30 seconds on a, a Mac M1. Uh, and then it comes back with a beautifully rendered file. And you can see there that the sort of specular effect on these screws, it looks really, really nice. So uh, yeah, big fan of uh, the rendering capabilities. I mean, it is limited. Uh, it's not as as uh, capable as something like Blender, um, but you can output these files um, to Blender and import them and do some really fancy animations within there. So the animation um, is quite basic. If I go to animation on here, I'll show you what that looks like. So I did a quite a a simple animation on here. You can click explode and it will do like an exploded view of all the different components that you've created. And then if you click play on here, um, it'll just sort of, on this particular one, I just said, put all them, reset them to their home position and just spin the camera around slightly. So if I go to here and I say, right, so I want for the next um, couple of seconds, I'm just moving on the timeline there. I want it to rotate to a side view like that. You can see there it's just generated that. So if I move that back and press play, it's just going to spin that round like so. And then it'll just keep looping the, the animation like so. And all that we need to do to sort of save it out is just click publish. Um, we select the resolution we're going for. So that's like a 1080p. And then you can say, where do you want it to be on your local machine, which is this bottom one here. And do you also want to save that to the cloud as well? If you save it to the cloud, you can do some additional things with it, like re-render it later on if you if you update some of the components. So I can do that and that's just going to render that out now. It doesn't use any fancy rendering for this uh, this animation. It is just using the, the frames as they're as they appear on screen at the moment. So there isn't any sort of fancy ray tracing. It is just kind of the the basic mode of um, rendering that it does there, but it's, it looks good enough. And these these videos are usually quite, quite nice to sort of put on a, a presentation or something like that. So you can see that that's just uh, completing there. So there we go. Looks like there's a tiny piece there. Yeah, that little piece there, I hadn't, I hadn't reset that to its home position. So I go back there. And I just spin around to the top. That's good to view there. So I'm not actually recording the changes I'm making. I can just click on that little piece. In fact, there's there's several pieces there. Let's go to the top. I can, I can include them as. Uh, there we go. That's the little header pin for the uh, the rangefinder piece. It's literally just that little piece there that they've they included on the very top. I hadn't included that on the transform and restore home. So if I now go back to there, we can now see that that's going to go into the case and go back to where it should be. There we go. We can go back into record mode now. And one of the quirky things with this, and this is where I, th I think it is a bit basic, is one of the ways you can view your objects is you can do this orthogonal view where everything's at um, this view and there's no perspective applied to that at all. So it looks kind of artificial, looks kind of like, a, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't look real. If you apply perspective to that, you can see it sort of looks, the, the thing that's closest to the camera looks larger and the thing that's further away looks smaller as it looks in real life. But you can then also have this perspective with orth orthogonal faces. So if I look at this front on, it'll sort of turn and then flatten out like that. And if you include that in an animation, so if I just move this out here and turn this round um, to the side and I play the animation back, it will do that weird. I don't know if you can see that when it plays now, it kind of does this sort of juddery effect because it's switching between perspective mode and this um, orthographic mode. I call it orthogonal mode, orthographic mode. So I think it's you know best to remember to either set it to perspective or um, orthographic, but not both when you're doing these animations. Uh, and you can have a storyboard. You can have a few different pages, different different storyboards, different views of that animation if you wanted to. We've got things like simulation. 
I remember doing this when I was uh, when I did computer science many many years ago. It must be like twenty odd years ago. Um, we studied um, what was it called? It's where we looked at um, finite element analysis, is what it was called. And you essentially have a piece of like material, like metal. It's usually one type of material, like plastic or metal or wood, and you can have a, a formula applied to that particular um, material and the finite element is how many of those formulas do you want to run for a given section of material and the more that you run the longer it takes but the more accurate it is and it's how you f figure out like car crashes in a computer animation or simulation um, you know how the, all the things deform it's because you've got these sort of rule of thumb formulas for how that particular uh, material behave under different stresses and where the stresses will be so it's interesting that they've got that in here you can look at various different things like stresses thermal properties you know structural buckling it's got in there event simulation non-linear static stress shape optimization so there's some pretty interesting things that you can do within that um, i've not looked at any of that yet but the stress one might be quite useful particularly with plastics uh, the manufacturer is for if you are doing more CAD um, CAM type stuff. So if you're looking at um, computer aided design and manufacture and it's not the um, 3D printed type. It's, it, so instead of it being um, additive like 3D printing, it's you're, you're taking material away from something. So you've got like a big block of aluminum and you're sort of just milling out them pieces. Then you, you come into this mode and you can set the paths and optimize for that. And there's a really great channel um, on YouTube. Um, is it NYC CNC? Uh, he's been doing that a couple of years now. And he literally started out as just this guy with a, a milling machine and Fusion 360. And he's now got this entire sort of company. Really, really great. And he's got some really in-depth videos on uh, how to use Fusion for doing um, computer aid manufacture. So that's quite a, a nice feature. And I think that's only available on the full version of Fusion 360. And then the last one is the drawing. So if I go to um, draw from design, um, what I can do is a really nice um, technical drawing of the model. So this is something that really speaks to me. One, one of my favorite subjects when I was in, um, let me just press on this OK button that's just here. When I was in school, we, we did, um, what did we call it? Technical, technical drawing, technical design, technical drawing, I think it was called. And yeah, you, you, we'd learned how to draw like the Volkswagen logo. I remember, you know, the exact measurements, the circles we had to do. We had this great big um, A1 um, desk to sort of, you know, sit at with a great sheet of paper clipped on. You had to have, your, you know, your nice mechanical pencil and you draw this out. Um, and, and I remember that when, when there was that, um, uh, not a meme, there, there was that... Um, Mandela effect that people are talking about about the Volkswagen logo having this tiny little gap in it. They said, "When did it have this gap? That's that's um, a Mandela effect. It never had this gap before." And if you look at a car, there's a little gap between the V and the W. And I thought, I remember drawing that gap. So I don't buy into this Mandela effect thing at all. I remember specifically drawing that out. Um, so yeah, this this uh, what you can do on here then. So let me just get rid of that help piece there and the learning panel we don't need that so we can just set what the scale is going to be and if I just click here you can see it's going to bring on the whole design there and I can decide that I want that to be instead of one to five but let's try two to one that's massive let's try one one to one that'll do and it'll draw that out nicely in a second and it's picked all the the lines of the the thing. So what you can do in here is you can come in and say, right, let's get a dimension. And I want to know from that point to that point what that's going to be. Or I want to know what the, you know, uh, let's find a, a circle. So if I want to know what the radius of that is there, it's got 3.8 for the radius. Again, I can draw in some more dimensions between various different points. And if you've got, if you've got radiuses like that, let's, let's, Let's zoom in on one of these pieces. You can see the very middle of that has got a little crosshair. You might actually want to put that crosshair on the centre mark. So you just find a, an edge like that and it'll draw in the centre mark as well, which is quite nice. So you can use this to really make your designs, um, you know, rememberable for the future. So what I've done with quite a few of the designs is 
I've gone in after I've finished the thing and I've, I've gone into this drawing mode and I put all the key measurements on there. So what does a, um, a servo, what are the key measurements for that? How wide is it? How tall is it? Where the lugs are? You know, what's the circumference of the, the round section on it? And um, it's, it's much easier to look at that, see all the key measurements and then recreate that sometimes and bring it in. So that's what I'll spend a bit of time doing um, after, typically after I've done that. So you can go in here and you can say, you know, output that to a PDF or to a drawing file, whatever you want to do. You can also have things like tables of measurements. Um, so if I just say OK on that, just move this bit further down. You can see there it's got all the different material. I kind of overlaid this so you can't see very well. Uh, but you can see there the name of all the components and what they're made of, for example. Um, get rid of that now. And we can do other things as well in there. We can call things out. We can give things names. We can look at angles of things. We can do sections. So if you want to look at something and slice it through, you can do that. Uh, and you can also do projected views. So if you want to sort of click on this and then have above it, um, you know, the top view and then at the side of it, I'm literally just moving this arrow, this cursor around and it knows based on where that is in relation to the center model, how to project that. So I'm just going to click that little button there and both of them will then appear as, you know, top views and side views and so on. So that can be really useful. So yeah, I love the drawing. Um, I love that capability that's in there. I'm just going to save that out. And one of the other things I didn't realize because it's not on that, um, I go back to there. On this view here, you can't see electronics, but you can design um, circuit boards. You can do an electronic design within Fusion. And I never knew you could do this. Um, I'll not do too much of that now, but yeah, you can essentially do stuff. The, the, the Autodesk do own Eagle, which is the premier package for designing circuit boards and stuff, but you can do all kinds of stuff in here. And then you can also simulate it as well. So pretty clever stuff. They also designed, um, sorry, an unknown Tinkercad. So Tinkercad has all this capability as well. So you can bring in things like Arduinos. You can, you know, add code to that and play around with it. Uh, a lot of this is hidden away in Fusion 360. So it's a very, very capable package. So absolutely love this software. So I'm just going to close that out there. Don't save. And the other thing that Fusion does, which I really like, is it version controls everything. So I can see every save that I've done right back to the very first save that I did. Uh, you can give them, you know, a bit of a comment on there, but all that version history is all in there. So if I make a real mess of something, I can just go back to a previous version. Really, really useful. And you can also view that on the web as well. If I click on that, it'll open up a web browser. It'll show me that design. And, you know, if you were collaborating with some other people in a team, you can all comment on that design as well. So really, really quite, you know, really, really cool. And you can put things in folders. Um, you can organize all your files like that. And there's that uh, MP4 file. Um, and that's just sat on their cloud there. So I've just opened that up. And uh, these are all the different projects and things that I've been working on for a long time. A lot of the very early pieces I did. I think the very first thing I designed in Fusion 360 was um, we had some uh, we had some puppies at the time, and we had these gates, and the gates were just singular pieces. And I thought I can design a little clip that will clip these two metal pieces that were like next to each other, just clip them together. So that's in there. There were some uh, parts for a tiger cub that my dad has um, designed those pieces, and my brother had um, golf, and he had a reverse camera on his golf. Uh, Golf GTI car and the plastic had broken on that so I printed him um, one of those parts and these are really like crude shapes it was just like a rectangle with a hole in it or just you know round shape um, but you know it, I did get some practice with the old calipers and sort of measuring things so really really got into this sort of design mindset I love this stuff so I thought I'd just share that with you and um, you know my thoughts with this Pico Crab, what we can do with it, you know, where it's up to. And like I said, there's a few things that I need to work on. It is a work in progress. It isn't perfect yet. Um, I've got quite a few things that I want to do with it next. And it's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> I'm also building Pico Cat at the same time. Um, so I do need to get back to that. And I've still got an unfinished um, 
Smars Auto DIY hybrid as well that I need to finish off. So all the things, <laughs> too many things going on at once. So if you're enjoying these videos, um, you can support me um, by going over to buymeacoffee.com uh, slash Kevin McAleer, and that'll help me pay for Fusion 360 for starters, because that thing is not cheap. Um, so I think I paid about a quarter of that already with what people have raised. Um, I usually have uh, royalty-free music, royalty music at the beginning of the show, uh, and that's by Epidemic Sounds. There will be a link down in the description to that if you want to check them out. Um, so they have loads of royalty-free music that you can include on your YouTube videos, and you don't get any copyright strikes for that. And the graphics software, I use Canva for doing a lot of the graphics on there. They have a free version and also like a paid version. I don't think I have any affiliate links for that yet, but I probably should do. Uh, and the streaming software that I use to actually broadcast this um, out to you. So this is going out on YouTube, Twitch, um, Twitter, well, Periscope, uh, Facebook and YouTube. And I use something called Restream um, to help me do that. So I literally just click a button and everything, all the things work that's not free and then all the expensive equipment that i have as well so the like lighting cameras lights all this kind of stuff this all needs paying for so if we raise some extra cash it just means we can keep the show going for like an extra year so i'm sure you uh, want to help me do that i also have a website so um i've literally just added in uh, pico cat to this website so if you go to smilesfan.com uh, you'll see on the top menu bar there's a little pico cat with a little cat emoji and you click on there and you can get all the files and videos and content around that. So I'm adding to that all the time. Uh, that's going to you know, extend over time. And I'll probably include the Pico um, Crab on there as well. It's just a bit of a side project. Uh, and I will release those STL files. Um, it's really fun. One of the most rewarding things to do other than coding is to design something in 3D software from scratch print that out and then have a physical thing that you've made that didn't exist in the world before you before you thought of it so highly recommend people have a play with that so yeah if you could check on the, the website you can see all that and uh, the other thing i just wanted to let you know about as well is every sunday i have a new live video so sometimes i go live during the week sometimes it's just a pre-recorded video i thought i'd go live for this particular one but uh, yeah every sunday i'm quite consistent with that so 7 p.m greenwich mean time so if you look on the screen there, you can see all the different time zones around the world. You know where you live and which one you're probably closest to, and you'll know when that one that is. So I think that's all the things I wanted to cover off in this show today. So I hope you enjoyed that little look at uh, Pico Crab, and I'll carry on working on this. I will finish it. Uh, I've really enjoyed doing the Fusion 360 and learning you know, a bit more about how that works. Uh, and hopefully I've covered everything off I intended to talk about. So... Thanks for watching. I'm just going to quickly see what comments we had on there because um, I saw quite a few of these pop up. So, hey, Paul, how's it going? So let me just bring this down here so I can actually see what people said. So you're going to sit quietly now and try and figure out what is happening. <laughs> what is all this about? Um, so then we've got uh, Dominic. He says, evening, Kevin. Missed the live show, but caught up in this weekend. Great le learning a lot. And... Uh, We've got Lynn on there as well. She's saying, hey, pals. So just calling out to everyone in the, um, the chat window there. So we've got um, Paul there from uh, Love Audio Productions. We've got Jackie, my cousin. Hi, Jackie. How are you doing? Hope you're enjoying this. Um, we've got Blackout. Wow, I didn't know Fusion could do um, FEA stuff. Yes, it, Fusion can do so much stuff. Um, you can spend quite a lot of time learning about that. And again, uh, Love Audio says that's an amazing piece of software. So yeah, there's so much you can do with Fusion 360. Um, there, are, there is a free version of that. If you go onto Autodesk, you can download the hobby slash student slash personal version, I think they call it. And they say it's free for a year, but all they mean is each year you just have to go back and say, I want another license and they'll honor that. So it will be free forever. They do look like they're crippling it somewhat by adding extra things in there so that, um, you, you know, it makes it more appetizing to buy the full version because I think a lot of people are downloading the free version and doing a lot with it. <laughs> so, you know, I can't blame them for wanting to sort of invite people to you know, buy the full version, but it's really worth it. And I, I'm getting a lot of value out of it myself. So thanks for watching on that. Um, I, I enjoyed uh, sort of sh sharing that with you, the Pico Crab, and um, I'll see you on Sunday. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next time.
Yeah.